Yo, 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 it's Thursday, which means it's time for another Open Metaverse stream. And I'm open on the Frogland IO page here. We're going to be talking to Frogland imminently, but I wanted to start with some statistics. Oh, yeah, Goblin Town is just eating up the volume right now. What is it? I have no idea. Honestly, I don't really care either. Um, we're much more interested in the fact that Ethereum is just dropping through the floor right now. And why is that? Well, we don't know. It's a bear market. Things are weird. But NFTs still seem to be trucking on board ape yacht club obviously other d the tripping ape tribe what what is this stuff it seems like we just cannot get enough of ten thousand item collections of nfts the interesting thing for me though is is much more looking at the trend so the metaverse is a, is a trend that we should be paying attention to i'm hearing about the metaverse as this trillion dollar opportunity in the next 20 years it's going to be the next iterative phase of the metaverse Massive hype cycle. Thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. Boom. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's adding the word metaverse to their business plan, to their business proposition. And then, of course, this very familiar graph. Oh, gosh, we're popular. Oh, look, we're really, we're still popular. And then, oh, no, nobody cares. Right down here in this trough of dispond, as we like to call it, um, this is the moment of maximum opportunity. If you are in the metaverse space, it's quiet. Real conversations can take place. And I will tell you this for free. The metaverse ain't going anywhere. The metaverse is still as hot as it always was. It's just the hype, the chat, the obnoxious just appendage of that word to everything has gone away, which means real things can start to be built. The thing is, a lot of those things were being built already and have been being built for the last year, 18 months, you know, and are starting to come out into the wild. And that is why... We bring ourselves now to the Notorious Frogs. Here are the Notorious Frogs. I wager that you will not have seen a collection of PFPs or, or characters or items anywhere in the space that look quite like these. They have a very specific aesthetic. You may like it, you may not like it, but you cannot fault it for being distinctive. But of course, these characters themselves are only a very small piece of the story. And I use the word story advisedly because Frogland everything it represents is about story. It's about co-creation. It's about taking a story world, taking ownership of that world, and then fumbling your way through it as a collective. And we're starting to see more and more of these grow up. Obviously, Board Ape, Other Side, that is a story world, but it's very much VC-driven, VC-led. It's Yuga's vision. But Cyber Brokers, for instance, is a, is a great example of a project where people are really invested in the biggest story. Now, I'm obviously biased because I do the podcast for Cyber Brokers, but it's a great example of how if you can work in great story with great art and great execution, it really is compelling. And it is something that will keep people coming back no matter what the rest of the market is doing. And that's why I'm very excited today to bring on, let me get the, right, the names right. I've got Ed Mason, who is Snoop Frog. We have Matt, also known as Froggy Digital. And we have Daniel, Don Love, also known as Gamma Bunter. Welcome, guys. <laughs> I hope I got that right. You have yeah. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for having us. I got to say, we're we're hopping with joy to be able to be on the uh, the Defiant. So really delighted to be here, and thank you for your time. Well, it's awesome to have you here. It was also like this is one of those rare occasions where I hear I hear English accents. <laughs> like <laughs> we've, we've got a bunch of limeys on the stream, and that's that's yeah. that's fresh. Singular, that's awesome. sir. <laughs> Don't throw me into that crowd. <laughs> I have to. That's, this. This sounds like a South African. Am I? Am I right? Am I picking yes. up? Yes. Well done, sir. I'm picking up a Sappho. Where are you? Where are you, sir, in the world? Or do you not want to dox yourself too heavily? Oh uh, uh, no, I'm in Malta, but I'm from South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Listen, give give us give us an idea of, of, of Frogland, what it's about, and and basically some of the progress so far. Because you're not a new project by any stretch. You've, you've been around for some time. Um, but I'm curious, like, to hear the journey, the genesis, and and where you've got to in the last 12 months. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a fascinating 12 months, to say the least. Um, we all met uh, working in the Web3 space sort of over a year ago now. Um, we've all been dabbling in various aspects of technology or entertainment. Um, and having got together and seen what this space offers, we saw back in about June, July of last year that there was something desperately uh, lacking. We had something fascinating happening in this Web3 world, which was emerging technology and content creators converging. 
we were having a lot of these sophisticated people able to make incredible content and now spending their time and energy researching and learning how emerging technologies are working to leverage NFTs into what they're building. And we saw the space as it was last year, and we saw the metaverse applications that were already out there. And they were good, but fundamentally, they were very much um, open source games built with a lot of Web3 tech on top of them. And around this time, the metaverse applications that were out there, they had come to be before the advent of PFPs. And then we see a new landscape of emerging where we had a lot of people spending a lot of money and associating themselves with their digital identities, with their PFPs, but no home for them to, to sort of run around it. So we set out to build something new, effectively a metaverse that was focused on the PFPs, on the artwork, on the story, on the narrative of these collections that people attach themselves so much to. So that was really the, the, the idea that started Frogland, uh, was how can we build a world that had a higher level of graphical fidelity, a higher level of engagement and entertainment than other platforms that we may have seen out there. Um, no small feat, and we spent many months teaching the nuances of degen culture, of NFTs, of DeFi to a, a world-class game development studio. Uh, a, a team, in fact, that worked on games like The Wipeout and uh, The Getaway and PlayStation Home, who were very well accustomed to building engaging and immersive experiences. And then working with some exceptional Web3 engineers, we started to bring the two together so that we can start building out a metaverse that was not just a, an online video game, but it really tapped into what Web3 could offer and allow us to build a playground for the cool kids, for the artists, for the content creators to be able to come in, leverage tools that were already known and loved and embraced by developers to start co-creating and building in a way we never saw possible before the advent of Web3. That, that, that's a lot to take in. So th the first thing that jumps out here is you were, I guess, responding to the fact that CryptoVoxels, Decentraland, and like this sort of weird, vague promise of sandbox or whatever it was, was unsatisfactory. I'm presuming that you then went, okay, well, we have amazing tools like Unreal Engine and we can create photorealism and we can create immersive, beautiful storytelling, but somehow plug in these PFPs and make them part of that story. The world-class game developer part, that's quite a big leap. But there's a lot of teams that, promise to make a game but they've never made a game and so they think making a game is like making a pfp collection <laughs> and they realize that no 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 it's not it's nothing like that it, unreal engine is one of the flakiest pieces <laughs> of software you've ever used and it crashes constantly and you're like oh this is this is this is what it's really like making a game so and I'm, I'm really sort of i'm wondering firstly how you how you funded yourselves through like, I mean, game development is not cheap. And also, you know, what was your ambition for this game to be a game? It's the co-creation bit I get, but like, it still has to be a good game at the same time. Precisely. So, so I mean, to answer your, your first question, um, we set about the idea to build in a new way. And that was effectively the way traditional game development operates. And again, I've come from about 10 years in the game space. Um, I've, I've, I've been around the block when it comes to this, this content and technology creation. But effectively, the, the old fashioned model, which was put together a business plan, go and convince some, some investors with some cash to go and build a product in stealth, and then hope once you release that product that the community or the consumers, so to speak, would, would like what has been built. But that, in our opinion, is very much the archaic model, uh, the pre-Web3 model. And so we set about to create a collection of 10,000 Notorious Frog NFTs and use proceeds from the sale of those NFTs to build this metaverse out. So last September, we actually sold the collection out, and that allowed us to provide the funding necessary to start developing the Notorious Frog world, uh, Frogland, as we call it, the centralmost district of a metaverse we call New Pangaea. So that was how we managed to, to raise the funding. But opposed to the traditional method, which was raise in, in sort of behind closed doors and then start building, we started building with our community. And so we really started focusing on what is it that members in our community would like to do? How do they want to spend their time? And when you look at a metaverse, we see it very much like the next iteration of a social media platform. We see Web3, in fact, like a three-dimensional version of an internet, or at least a transition from a 2D internet to a 3D internet. And we already know what's popular in a 2D world so far. We, we've been gamifying elements in our Discord, and we've been testing and, and working back and forward with our community to see what is most engaging. And with feedback and input we get from our community, we start to build that out into the 3D world itself. So effectively, this notion of co-creation and uh, working with the community to provide the funding is a very radical change, especially back last September when we started uh, working on this project. Um, the game development studio themselves are, are tremendous. You know, we've, uh, 
we've been fortunate enough. I've known the head of the game dev studio for quite a few years. Um, in fact, both of us were honored to give a panel to the United Nations about NFTs and the metaverse a, a few short months ago. And we've been dabbling with immersive technologies for quite some time. And you've, you hit the nail on the head. Building a game is not easy. Um, certainly, if you look at a game like GTA V that costs hundreds of millions of dollars and, and thousands of people to put together, it's infeasible to expect one small team to be able to deliver all of that. But this is where the, the power of community comes in. This is where we can now start working with members of our community that are passionate, um, intelligent, and understand content creation and technology to start building out what we believe this new world to be. Okay, so there is a there's an execution problem here, which is your community are an unknown quantity and you don't know what their skills are and you don't know what it is that they can actually do. And also people tend to drop off in enthusiasm quite quickly on things because they see another 10,000 item mint that they might jump into that can make them some money. So how do you keep them active and interested? And how do you ensure that the quality of your execution remains as high as you would like it to be? So it's a great question. And this is really where the founding team's expertise comes in. Um, so I've, I've had a long background in the, in the tech world. In about 2013, my companies developed the first self-contained virtual reality headsets. Uh, we formed partnerships with NVIDIA. We built products and prototypes with companies like Mattel and Samsung and LG. So we're somewhat familiar with the, the, the development aspect. And then when we start bringing in some of our co-founders, um, members who've been working with sort of uh, Lucasfilms and Disney for 20 plus years on IP like Star Wars and Harry Potter, and then we start bringing in the creative elements that the community can submit, such as audio or, or image edits that you can find inside the experience that we released in Christmas time. Um, we can start to, to find those members of the community who are most passionate and also most able to deliver and to contribute in some shape or form. But fundamentally, it is all still a very a, a world-class team who have had decades of experience on executing and delivery and simply working with a community um, in the open uh, rather than doing it all behind closed doors. And it's it's a, a, a novel concept, but ultimately it's a much easier concept to move forwards in when you do have the support of members who have been passionate about what you're trying to build. And how do you keep them motivated and incentivized? Do you, do you, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have a token, right? It's called Frog. <laughs> we don't have an actual uh, token itself, uh, at least nothing yet. We, we only have the NFTs presently. Um, but of course, this is being gamified quite a bit. So inside our Discord, um, there are ways that you could uh, you could bring in frog dollars. And this goes everything from, again, community feedback. People wanted to play some games, and we discovered of, out of snail racing and horse racing and dog racing and chicken fighting and poker, which of these games were most enjoyable. And in, in doing that, we managed to start bringing in and focusing on elements that our community were more responsive to. And in return, if you do certain actions within the Discord, you can get paid in some frog dollars, which is sort of a, a gamified, not yet a token itself, but certainly a way that people could be incentivized to continue to, to collaborate and, and, and operate inside the community itself. So beyond being able to do some magnificent things like collaborate, uh, we had a double Grammy Award winning musician, uh, one of our, our long term frog holders inside our Discord, doing a collaboration with some musicians that we have inside the space. This producer had produced a few songs for us that is now being backed with and forwarded to members of our community every Saturday in an audio fashion where we have Sappho Studios, effectively a record label that's been created within. And Frogland's job is effectively to provide talent and to provide interest and exposure towards this, this studio and to bring in these, these titans of the music world to be able to start uh, cooperating and collaborating with members of our community, people who may have only just picked up a frog and wanted to come and have some fun dabbling around. So there's a huge amount of way that the value is returned to the users themselves, both experientially as well as being able to take part in this, this, this noble journey that we've embarked on, which is to build something in a new way for the better. Yeah, I've seen quite a few boutique record labels grow up around these PRP projects. Like, but particularly young rappers I've seen come in and just kind of lay out a tune because it's relatively straightforward with a beat and to do something funny with a rap on top of it. And it seems to be quite a, a common thing that happens. Um, you see people designing and doing memes and that kind of thing. I mean, I remember in the, the old shitcoin days, it would just be someone which is like say, oh, I can do a GIF or I can do uh, an infographic. And they were uniformly terrible. I remember at Harmony, we used to put out like community bounties for people to do these things and you'd have to judge them because it was a competition. You're just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the terrible can sometimes be charming. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But there is a, there's this sort of dichotomy between like, particularly when you're a layer one, every, every execution is 
paramount and every mistake is pounced on then you have this really kind of janky community led creative arm to things and that that's i've always found that's hard to to bring in and and, and reconcile because I, I mean i run a creative studio here and we i'm i'm a total dictator like it's just like it's my way or the highway but but in the nicest possible way i'm a benevolent dictator but like i i find it very difficult to kind of relinquish control to the great unwashed effectively um uh, because i'm a snob and because i'm a I'm a paranoid freak, basically. Well, well so, I mean, it's we've, tough, right? We've been incredibly fortunate to uh, have some amazing community members who have, uh, you know, coalesced around this idea. Um, I think, you know, part of our thesis here is that, um, you know, taking agency and ownership over the creative process and seeing your contributions come to life as part of a greater whole is um, something that people extrapolate a lot of value out of, right? That's somewhat intangible. And, um, you know, since the, the very first day, you know, we were running like D&D style RPGs in our Discord and, and things like that to just uh, spur that creative spark. Um, I think, you know, what we've seen a lot of is that, um, you know, people who maybe, you know, were creative in a former life, uh, you know, or had a different job, you know, worked as like maybe a graphic designer when they really wanted to be an artist, um, went through the pandemic, rediscovered that stuff, and they've been looking for an outlet for those those sorts of things. And, um, you know, our community has coalesced around some very talented individuals from a very diverse group of backgrounds. So um, in a sense, like people get value out of just being able to talk with other different people who have differing opinions and ideas and experiences and, and things like that. And that's led to uh, a pretty significant amount of stickiness around some of the specific groups of people that we have that are, um, that are actually building in the community right now. And it's been great to see that. Yeah. yeah it's a, it's a fun time, right? The, the, oh, right. the thing that I love so much about it, cause I've had so many like DeFi channels and, and like hardcore DeFi stuff. It's dry. It's so dry. I mean, it's awesome and it's exciting, but like then you get into a, a PFP or an NFT collection chat and people are like, you just get these weird crystals of kind of ideas and people kind of starting to form their own, their own identity around stuff, stuff that they do. And, but the, the challenge I've always seen is that like, it, it's keeping that momentum going over longer periods of time is always very difficult. And the, the market sentiment plays such a big role in all of this. And I, you, you guys have been around a while, I seem to remember it was not that long after Board Apes that you came out, actually, um, and that I was aware of you. Because I seem to remember that you you partnered up with, let me get this right, um, Wicked Craniums in the land of Osea. Yeah. That was when Wicked Craniums were still mm -hmm. kind of hot and relevant and a thing. <laughs> I still love the Craniums. They're a great body. The art is so good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great. Exactly. You know, they, like, I, do you remember when the craniums came out? Like, literally a week after Board Apes, everyone was like, "This is the next Board Apes. This is going to be the one. This is going to be the one that if you miss Board Apes, this is the wicked craniums." And it was like, "No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> what a different trajectory they went on." But still, awesome. So, for what what has it been like managing your community through ups and downs in in the broader macro of all of this? Well, We've I'll, I'll do you don't know. So I mean, they are certainly always, uh, you know, there's always ups and downs in energy and, you know, ebb and flow. But I mean, something that's really made, I think, quite a difference for us is um, the community, uh, you know, we, we didn't build around like um, uh, overhyping specific things. And so we very specifically curated our community early on and uh, and built a very particular vibe and attracted a, a bunch of people who are really in it for the long term are really well-meaning, awesome people uh, and are here to contribute. And so there's a really good uh, basis, a really, uh, <laughs> a really strong underpinning to our community of people who've been in the project for, for a while and are really deeply, uh, you know, emotionally invested. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, uh, been a big uh, a big part of the staying power is really just um, creating that culture and that vibe. I mean, you were speaking about the dryness of DeFi. I, I like to think of if, if DeFi is uh, money Legos, NFTs are culture Legos. Um, culture Legos. I like it. Well, the composability of literally everything is something that, that people, that muggles, crypto muggles just can't wrap their head around. They're like, 
what what was that composability that we talk about? Took yeah, our, our community keeps us on our toes too, which keeps it fun. You know, I mean, this is probably the most fun project I think any of us have ever worked on, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the just the surprises and the pushback, right? So, in a sense, we're we're outsourcing the writers' room in a sense here, right? And um, what that's led to is just like uh, spontaneity and creativity that we wouldn't be able to come up with sitting in a conference room with a whiteboard on our own. And like that, that really kind of keeps the culture and the vibe going because every time we set up hitting a lull, it's like all of a sudden somebody else comes up with something that's really great and we just latch onto it. And then we go and we build something with that or work it into the the process and it has an impact on everything that comes after it. Um, there's a really good example, actually. Uh, early on, one of uh, one of our mods um, promised a group in the uh, in the community that they could get a casino, and this is like I don't know, maybe four weeks after we launched, and uh, it was like you know I think it was like a late Saturday night, and we're all we have a meeting about it, like an emergency meeting. We're like, what is this guy doing? He's promising them a casino, or like, and he, we're going to give it to him. We're like, well, okay. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this? Uh, well, we're going to have them play for it, right? So we created a and d module, like a style uh, RPG module, and ran that through uh, through the Discord and had the group play for it. And in that process, um, you know, we generated uh, a couple of different new enemy types, new item types, uh, and other sorts of content that we could use to mine to, uh, to help inform exactly what we're building and put names on some of the different tokens and things like that that we're going to end up building. So it ended up being like uh, an immensely positive process. But, you know, at, at first we were, we freaked out a little bit. And then, you know, once we realized that there was really a dialogue there with the community on how that was supposed to go and how it was supposed to work, it just set the tone for everything else that came after it, really. Yeah, you, you said something interesting there, which was open sourcing the writer's room or outsourcing the writer's room. And I think people who watch, as we all do, enormous amounts of TV and Netflix, everything else, are probably unaware of just how important writer's rooms actually are having a group of people who sit down and break story who put cards up on a wall and go through and figure out what the arc of a character is going to be and what the arc of a story is going to be and then when you get mad at damon lindelof because the end of lost sucked you know, <laughs> a lot of there are a lot of writers that sat in a room and bashed out 24 episodes a season of lost before they were able to even get to an ending um, <laughs> if you haven't seen the leftovers go and see what lindelof did next because there's a few better yeah. but anyway this idea of outsourcing the writer's room like writing and story are are words that I'm seeing more and more thrown around. And every time I see the word story, I'm like, who is, who is the writer? Who's, Who's the writer? writer? And, and like, that's one of the things that, that makes this experiment that we're doing here so yeah. interesting because, you know, we have, we have ideas about where we want the story to go and, uh, you know, different components and broad strokes, but how we get there is very much up to the people who are participating. And uh, there's a lot of twists and turns and there's this balance that we have to walk between, uh, you know, uh, designed by committee and keeping help, holding things back for a surprise so that, you know, it's still fun and engaging for people. And, you know, we are still figuring that out to a sense, but um, that has been one of the more fun parts of this whole journey is figuring out exactly what types of things we should push out and how we should prompt people uh, in order to get them to uh, respond in the way that we're hoping for without having it be leading, for example, right? You know, and things like that. So um, another example of this is that we um, we created a map a few months ago and, you know, on the eve of releasing the map, um, what our creative director uh, decided uh, that you know we should um, we should cut it up into pieces and make it a puzzle to discover it, and we made a game out of it in the Discord. So um, created a bunch of different bot commands and things, and you had to go on a hunt and try to find the different pieces of the map that were stolen by these salamanders, um, who are the evil salamanders, and the the Frogland Bureau of Instigation um, <laughs> was on the hunt, but they're also a corrupt organization. And um, what we saw in this experiment was that uh, different groups of people in the discord uh you know coalesced around teams trying to complete the map and we told them there was going to be a surprise or a prize but we didn't tell them exactly what that was and people just kind of ran with it you know and this ran for uh, a few weeks i think before people got enough of the pieces together and then um when it was becoming apparent there were a few different groups who were kind of you know taking the lead you know we reached out and we, we did a bit of a post-mortem on that stuff and said okay what did you like about this process what what do you not like um what did you expect the prize was going to be and of course people were a lot of people were like free shit but um you know that wasn't surprisingly there wasn't that much of that at all people were just there to play the game and have fun and um 
through that process, what a couple of other things that we learned was that, uh, you know, sometimes people's uh, allegiances, allegiances can be transient, right? Um, there were a few individuals who were working in multiple different groups. And when one, the one group had pulled ahead, they very much identified with that side, but they were also feeding information over to the other groups to make it competitive and fun because no one likes winning by a landslide. You know what I mean? So uh, there was like the self-balancing mechanism that we saw happening that really taught us something very particular about how we can structure those types of coordination games uh, in the community and to uh, inspire people's creativity in that way. And all of that came from the community itself. You know, when we didn't create that, we were just observing, you know, it was really, really interesting. Yeah, th this is this is fascinating stuff, isn't it? You, you create a swamp, essentially a primordial soup, and then and then trigger something and then just basically see what happens. That that demands just so much bravery and balls. And it's when, you know, when people say, what's your roadmap? You just go, the roadmap is the process. That's what the roadmap is. And, and the roadmap will reveal itself if we trust the process. But trusting that process is, is, is I mean, it's not a thing you can go to VCs and say, we have this process. And uh, it'll just reveal <laughs> itself. They'll go, yes, but... Well, what does monetization stage one look like in this and that? It, it's a very difficult thing for a VC to wrap it, wrap their heads around. I've been trying to sell some stuff or get, getting early conversations with VCs uh, recently, and, and they all come back with the same thing. It's like, how do you scale yourself? How do you scale a creator? And how do you, you know, like media projects are traditionally lousy venture scale investments. So it's just like, yeah, nah. So it's amazing what Yuga's managed to do to sell Andreessen Horowitz on the the other side. Do you do you look at that that project and think, good God, what would we do with four hundred and sixty million dollars plus three hundred and sixty million dollars plus whatever else they they make daily <laughs> royalties? It is. I mean, it's uh, look fascinating possibilities. Um, but I think with new technology, things should be done in a new way. And I think we would be missing some valuable lessons if we simply gave into the Web2 uh, methodology instead of really embracing what Web3 can bring to the table. Um, so we've we've intentionally not gone looking for, for that VC funding. Uh, we do believe enough in communities and in the growth of the space that we can build a model that allows us to continue to scale with the community. And certainly our actions over the past sort of better part of a year now have definitely demonstrated that, that we can, we can continue to build. We can continue to provide frameworks to a community and work with them to be able to build off of that. Um, I think it's a, it's a, an important nuance. Um, I think the space is growing rapidly enough that we will see that sort of um, funding levels coming through for projects that actually have something to build and something to deliver. So really, we believe that what this space so desperately lacks at the moment are the, the overall standards that developers already know and love to be able to build <clears throat> experiences that are fully interoperable. Um, we touched on the game development studios earlier on because, again, we felt a lot of the, the content out there could be improved on. We felt that certainly there's a lot more fun that can be brought. There's a lot more immersion that can be brought. Um, but the issue was game developers were too busy making money making games to really look into the Web3 world. Um, but uh, yeah, when we came on to, um, to, to give a panel at uh, GDC at the Game Developers Conference, um, it was curious to see just how many of the game developers, which I'd say pretty much all of them bar none, were looking at NFTs and Web3 as a way to integrate into the games, which ultimately is going to result in much higher quality gaming, which in turn is going to bring up a new audience. Um, so it really is a fascinating world, and I'd love to see how this technology can be leveraged to, to bring out uh, a slightly different future to one that we may already be familiar with. I was talking to a developer who's building what it's called the Emergence SDK. It's basically it's a, a way of bridging from traditional Web2 games to NFTs and just it's a layer that can, can stick on top. And he was just saying, you know, the, these this pushback on NFTs from game developers is driven by influencers and a kind of mob mind tilde version of events. It's like, I have read this so you don't have to. I'm angry, therefore you can be angry with me. And he said, basically, you know, th they will be kings. They already think they're kings, but now they really will be kings if they embrace this and understand it properly, but in a, in a much more fun way. So I'm, I, I want to dig up an image now because this, this image speaks to me for so many reasons, and it's this one. <laughs> so, like, I, I mean, in my head, I'm, I'm hearing Jack Nicholson in Chinatown, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like just just the classic film, but you've got Humphrey Bogart, you've got everything going on here, bit of, bit of Blade Runner, but like frogs, 
film noir, smokiness, and then there's the this the bizarre aesthetic of the frogs themselves. I mean, you you put together something striking and weird and different, and and that's absolutely to your credit. I'm, you know, like game disease. I don't know if you've seen that project. Like they're so epically weird. Just like, wow, where does this go? So I think that, that firstly, how did you learn film noir as, as a as a genre? Because I think it's so rich and so beautiful anyway. But like, why that one in particular? I mean, it's um, again, a great question. We We really wanted to do something differently. You said weird and wonderful is uh, definitely where it's yeah. actually. So surrealism, surrealism was really the the main kind of hook here, right? So um, again, you know, we're we're conceptualizing this project coming out of the pandemic, just like everyone else was kind of, you know, searching for what comes next in a sense. And through that, like, you know, shared tragedy, what we felt like was that, you know, there was a lot of pent up energy for expression and uh, for people to, you know, kind of process the different emotions that they've been having over the past couple of years and, you know, uh, understanding themselves. And we look back at, uh, you know, the, this style of film and the surrealism specifically where um, you have this uh, juxtaposition of things that might seem mundane and normal um, uh, in certain settings, but you put, you put them on this backdrop of something that is just completely, absolutely absurd. And it, uh, it, it allows you to, it allows the mental space for someone who's participating in this, whether creating it or enjoying it as entertainment to, um, to take a step outside of their boundaries and, uh, you know, consider things from a different angle or perspective. And we thought that having that as a core mechanism was really going to help people spur that creative process to be able to develop, uh, you know, different things and pour their emotions out in a way where they don't necessarily have to identify with them uh, 100% in that sense. So um, from that, it was a really strong kind of narrative hook from from that perspective. It, it well, that's also, awesome. Well, listen, you, you have done the unthinkable. This is, this. you must never do this, but you've actually delivered a game you, you know that that's that's like the worst thing you can do you must promise everything and deliver nothing that is that is the pfp way um so damn it you've changed the game for everyone the delivering game so what, what i would love to do is is see the game see it played but before we do that we must hear from the people that make all of this possible our lovely sponsors coming right back Earn up to $2,500 in NFT rewards from top collections like Mutant, Ape, Yacht Club, Azuki, Doodles, and more when you sign up for Slingshot's mobile waitlist. Slingshot is a Web3 trading platform where you can discover and trade over 7,500 crypto tokens at the best prices at lightning fast speed. With a super sleek, intuitive UI, you feel like you're trading on a centralized exchange when you're actually trading DeFi. Trade now on desktop and make sure to grab your slot on the mobile waitlist. Sign up at slingshot.finance forward slash the defiant. Decentralization of Ethereum gives us security. Layer 2 protocol Arbitrum gives us low cost transactions. TracerDAO's perpetual pools gives us liquidation free, long term leveraged tokens. The combination of all three of these unlocks the full potential of DeFi. Using Tracer, you can take long or short positions with leverage to trade anything commodities, cryptocurrencies, equities, even NFTs. Dive into perpetual pools at tracer.finance and learn more about this exciting release with The Voyage, a six-week journey in Tracer's perpetual pools to earn TCR rewards and explore the potential. Oh man, every time I, I, I hear the sponsors message, I'm like, there is so much going on out there. It is insane. It's just like... Just feasting your eyeballs on everything that's going on and trying to stay on top of it is it's it's nuts. yeah we've all we've all been around for a while and you know I remember especially you know in the last bear market in 2018 being familiar with every project right knowing every project in crypto that was developing something cool and interesting and then you know leading into DeFi summer and then especially with this explosion that's happened through the NFT market it's just impossible to keep up with now and that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, basically, we just need to blame everything on Andre Cronier. Just blame Andre. He's gone. <laughs> like, it's all Andre's fault. Yeah. So, um, guys, did you, do you have a demo for me? Absolutely. Let me share my screen. And... Share your screen. Let's get into this. Can By the I... way, if you're coming on the stream, we expect you to see Pudgy Penguins. Lucanets is coming up. We just need to have a, a lovely demo of the Frogland platform game. And um, and then we'll get on to Luca and Pudgy Penguins, which was actually an 
really incredible chat. I, I love what, what I heard from from Luca. But let's um let's get into this. What am I looking at here? So what you're looking at is the Dragonfly Social Club. So um, this what started as a gang inside our Discord quickly flourished into this vertical slice that you can see before you. Um, as you can see, this is the 1930s, the, the Frog Noir, the Film Noir, which is with an amphibian spin, if you like. Um, but everything that you see in here has been co-created by members of the community. Effectively, as you can see, for instance, this murder mystery site we have here um, really stemmed from a, a live RPG session of Murder of Jimmy the Knee. Uh, again, a text-based adventure that was then fleshed out into a 3D environment. Uh, we have little Easter eggs. I'm going to show you all the tarot cards, but these sort of begin to tell the story for Jimmy the Knee himself. Um, but who, who, who wrote this RPG? So this was the framework and the, the, the story was really concocted by some of our Hollywood creative directors and then passed to the community by way of a, a, disco, a uh, FRPG module. So from there, it was then down to the community to start playing the game. We have a, a wonderful dungeon master who sort of guides the uh, community members through it. And with that, we start fleshing out the concept and the narrative for the game world itself. Um, so we can see here the murder site and the ghost of Jimmy the Knee. But as we walk around, we can see everywhere from the images on the walls uh, to the newspaper that you can have here, which is updated every month uh, from going on inside the, uh, the Discord, inside the community itself. Um, we have a fortune teller inside our community who provides us pros that you can go in. Your misuse of your spiritual your guidance words, has been noticed. Um, little books and all sorts of nice little nods to the heads to members of the community who have helped create in some shape or form. Um, again, really looking to have a world that embraces the look and feel of these, these gangs of frogs um, with a slightly higher graphical fidelity than what you may have already seen in, in other metaverse experiences. Um, there's a lot of Easter eggs in here. I may, I may have a fleeting part of one, but you can see a little, two little abortion items tucked away inside the walls. Um, yeah, we have, um, we have a Medium article out that actually highlights um, everything that is in here that came from the community. I think there were, you know, 100 or 150 different items, something like that, or just different concepts. Like you said, everything on the walls, um, the, there's a drink menu that is all froggy related drinks like Hoptini, for example. Um, and all of that was like, we were just hanging out in the Discord like, hey, we need some drinks for the bar. What are they going to be? Sex on a log. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you know, people were just coming up with this stuff, and um, you know, sometimes you know, we we tell people exactly what it's for. Um, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we read in a, a small group so that there's enough people who kind of can lead the conversation and the questioning and everything. Um, but yeah, you know, this is a it's it's an example of what we can build using this model where um, we're we're working with the community to develop the content rather than just creating something prescriptive. But forgive me if I'm wrong here. This feels like a museum of things what our community have done in it rather than mm. a playable game. So how do you make it into a, a good game? Because, I mean, I could just go out and collect random thoughts from random strangers, plus them in, a, in a, you know, an environment I download from the Unreal Marketplace and then, you know, Bob's your uncle. But what, yeah. what is it different about this and how is it gamified? So this this particular example is more of a tech demo than anything else. Um, you know, there are dice in here and whatnot, and we're going to continue to update this. Um, you know, avatars or something else that's on our, our roadmap here very fairly soon. Um, as you maybe have noticed, the um, did you say roadmap? I think you yeah. mean toad map. Toad map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. These avatars are, are bronzed out, and that was because we wanted to have something. We needed to have something in here, um, but we didn't want. People to, to think and feel that those were the ones that they were getting for their frogs specifically. So um, the avatar model is still being worked on, uh, and then there's uh, there's different RPG elements that'll come into play. So at a certain point, we're going to start adding NPC characters, um, and then uh, you'll eventually just be able to walk out outside of this front door and and enter the world effectively. So um, there's there's a lot of different components and a lot of different competing priorities on like what to build and when and which parts are very important. But um, we're trying to focus very much on fun. Right. We want to make sure that what we're building uh, is uh, providing replayable value for people and is a place uh, that they actually want to come and spend some time. So um, we're doing some experiments right now with some other uh, 
uh, some other group and some friends to uh, use this as an event hosting space, um, you know, being able to bring your own NFTs and put them on the wall, you know, things like that, um, you know, seating the jukebox with uh, your own music and, and that sort of thing. So um, it's still very much an open experiment while we're building out the specific gameplay mechanics uh, of what's going to make this world possible. But um, we're very heavily influenced by RPG elements primarily for the gameplay side of this. Yeah, there's also, I mean, um, gameplay elements will be, you know, uh, modularized and like released along the journey, uh, such that there'll be different uh, aspects of gameplay um, and, you know, uh, coming out at different uh, times so that there's many different ways for people to play and, and interact and people can kind of um, choose to focus on one or spread their time across multiple uh, uh, et, et cetera. And those will uh, be ranging from RPG uh, type uh, mechanics that people might be uh, familiar with uh, to also uh, things that borrow from DeFi and are more uh, blockchain oriented, et cetera. Um, and you know, some of those modules will have some common elements between them that you could focus on one and then actually take things from there and use it in another. And some might be um, more isolated. Well, some will be more isolated. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's a lot to wrap your head around. There's going to be a, there's going to be a land. Am I, is that correct? That you're going to be issuing NFT land parcels of some description? Correct. So um, we had, in fact, announced back in September when we created this project that uh, everyone who purchased a notorious shrub would be able to claim a land deed. Um, a concept that we wrote heavily about in our uh, medium articles in about February. Um, so we're no nearing ever closer to that date, which is happening in June. So effectively, the way that this is going to build into the world itself is there's a lot of DeFi elements that are going to be baked into the, uh, the land deeds, into the terrain around Frogland by way of different biomes, different... I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say, so I'll probably defer to, uh, to Froggy Digital uh, to see if he wants to touch base on some of the, the, the DeFi elements that are coming into the game post-land itself. But yes, you are correct. There are land deeds coming to each and every notorious frog over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, as much as I hate to say soon, TM, <laughs> you know, um, we're still very much in that phase right now. We're building... Uh, we're in the process of building out uh, our web-based infrastructure, um, which is laying the foundation for stitching a lot of these different experiences together, right? So um, that is, um, it's maybe, t it's taking a, a, a little bit longer than a standard Mint uh, website would. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have uh, a, a few different development models uh, that are necessary for bringing this world to life, including uh, the use of like professional GIS tools. Um, you know, uh, obviously these types of thick client experiences that we have here that can be, um, you know, distributed through, uh, you know, various game stores, you know, web-based play experiences, mobile, all those sorts of things. And um, over the past few months, we've been laying this foundation in preparation for this uh, this this land launch that's that's going to be coming out here in uh, in June, and that's really gonna that's really what's going to set this whole thing up for us to be able to iterate very quickly on adding more uh, more fun experiences into into this world and starting to pull all the pieces together, right right. So that's kind of that's what's been in the process for the past couple of months. Yeah, and uh, I just to add, I mean that uh, robust like foundation. Um, is uh, what's going to, uh, what will allow us to accelerate on, you know, essentially tooling, uh, like builder tools for creatives, et cetera, um, uh, things that accelerate uh, their ability uh, to create in the community um, and for us to, uh, you know, help uh, integrate those, make them prominent, uh, uplift them, and, um, and, yeah, really be a central part of what we do that there's this uh, feedback loop between us and the community. Interesting. I, I just want to rewind to what you said, Ed. You talked about DeFi elements. Can you be specific about that? Because it's a little vague for me, what you mean by DeFi elements. So I don't know how much I'm allowed to reveal at this point in time. Alpha. Um, there, there could be a little bit here, but effectively we, we did release a Medium article um, a few weeks ago that talked about the essence of Frogland, um, the purpose for the frogs inside this metaverse itself and the land types that will exist in this world that we call Frogland. Um, <clears throat> Donlove, did you want to chime in? I don't know how much, maybe this would be a good time to reveal a little more info about the land types itself. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay, so there's different biomes, different locations in Frogland. We have uh, uh, revealed to the community that there will be resources uh, that uh, uh, people can collect, and these will skew uh, across different uh, biomes, and there is um, some randomization there, um, and you know, also with renewing of those, and then to get specific about, well, a little more specific uh, about uh, DeFi, essentially we're, we're borrowing some, uh, speci uh, some mechanics from Curve and, uh, and that kind of idea, uh, Curve and Convex and the Curve Wars, uh, and trying to uh, emulate that with some of the resource gameplay, essentially, with um, you know, w how people might get access to more resources and what they can use them for to get access to more. And you know, that's essentially can be thought of as um, one of the modules of gameplay that is coming is you know, uh, resource gathering through, uh, through land and biomes. Um, and those resources are uh, you know, one of the elements that would be then common across other game modules as well, where uh, many of the modules may incorporate those. Yeah, we've um, you know, we've touched on this a couple times already about and talked about composability, and you know that it really I think is is one of the big unfair advantages of working on in blockchain tech. And um, to the extent that we can, we want to make sure that our economic engine is able to plug into other tools that already exist and take advantage of uh, you know some of the other various primitives that have already been created that have been successful. And there's a few different uh, models I think that are really interesting. Um, you know, especially with the uh, coordination of liquidity and things like that, that, um, you know, we're going to be playing with. And there's going to be a lot more of that information coming out. But some of that stuff is still very much in design. Um, the leaning on curve uh, in particular, you know, I think it's, you know, it is a very early DeFi protocol. It's one of the most successful ones. And I think that this, um, you know, this, this fight over who has control over it in order to, like, you know, uh, vote themselves more benefit is uh, really interesting uh, in a sense. And a lot of other projects and protocols have tried to replicate that. And, um, you know, without getting too specific, I think we have an interesting idea on how we can put that together and make that very relevant for our community. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about Curve is that it, it served a very specific need, swapping stable coins, low slippage, high volume, right. and then boosting rewards through the Curve token. It was one of the very, very first governance tokens that we saw there was comp and then curve came out and the curve launch was just one of the craziest things i ever covered oh, yeah. in DeFi. it was so nuts the way it kind of just launched by itself completely like no, it wasn't us we didn't do it i know <laughs> yeah, yeah. <It's> bizarre. <laughs> I then, we caught a lot of shade for that but it's funny that like that it didn't it didn't stop the project from being successful no not at all because it, it i think everyone could see then that it the, the need it served was very important. But I, I think also the, the way Convex grew out of that was, you know, locking up your tokens for four years is not that exciting or desirable. So creating this sort of derivative version of that is is where the juice was. But it all happened really organically and then it got abused horribly. <laughs> and that, that, that's the blockchain way. You 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 know you you open a door and then the stampede just breaks the entire house down. That's yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> so we have a few different play styles, right? In a sense, like you, know, you can think of DeFi in and of itself as its own type of game, right? It's a it's a you know money game in a sense, and um, we, to the extent that we can, we are trying to uh, treat that as a first class citizen, as a, a specific gameplay style. You know, there are certain people who really enjoy those types of games, and um, that's the only thing that they want to play, and they're going to chase resources, and there's going to be balance in the system that. Uh, you know, fits that specific niche and need. And what what we're working through right now with the refine, refinement of this process is figuring out what are the right knobs to turn, um, which ones uh, do we need to give over control to the protocol in order to make it fun versus which ones are gonna be static or are gonna be driven by the narrative and the story um, and how to do that in, you know, a Web3 provident and provable way, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, we really want um, other projects to be able to um, kind of to, to fit in to what we're building here and be able to use our primitives as well. And um, in that sense, it's got to be open and permissive, you know, at that very, very basic layer. Yeah, no, understood. So uh, I've got a question for you. It's a very personal question from, from our side, which is I see a need, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong here, for high quality bespoke motion capture data. 
So like you want you want a character to move in a certain way. How are you going to get that data? You're going to use an XN suit. You're going to use a Rococo suit. The, the results you get out of those are pretty garbage. But is, is there going to be a need, do you think, for like high quality motion capture, you know, data on demand for the likes of yourself, so that you can you can actually respond to what people are asking for much faster? Yeah, I mean, motion capture is certainly one way of doing it. But as you pointed out, the suits themselves are far too cumbersome to really make it into everyone's homes. Uh, what we're seeing, though, is advancements in camera technology that means you don't need to don a suit to get some pretty good mocap. Um, but what I'm personally more fascinated with is volcap, so volumetric capture being brought into metaverse experiences, uh, something a little bit uh, further beyond the, the, the mocap itself. So being I'm able to take it right now. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> So very similar to mocap, where you're effectively you're, you're calculating the position and the pose by the user with sensors on suits or, or derived from cameras. Um, your Volcap uses a, um, a, a sort of a room filled with cameras, imagine, all placed about eight feet away from the user, um, which is able to take a photorealistic 3D models of those individuals and then paste them almost like a 3D model video into an environment like Unity or Unreal Engine. So you, you pass this uncanny valley issue that people have when, when building sort of human-esque kind of avatars, and you're able to still demonstrate something with high photorealism inside an immersive environment. Um, that is some very, very cool tech, uh, definitely worth checking out as when you get a moment. Um, Volcap, I think, uh, sorry, mocap. It's fun, but we see with the advent of virtual reality technologies, you're getting touch controllers that are able to to calculate your your sort of movements in quite a quite a decent capacity. Um, and I think the the underlying technology itself for for mocap needs to become a lot more accessible. So I think realistically, we'll see an iPhone or an iPad coming out soon enough that will allow you to just have good full body tracking just by placing a camera looking at you soon enough. Yeah, we we've we've invested in in a Vicon system. That's because we want, we want to have like, we basically want to build a holodeck. So we, we bought optical motion cameras and the results you can get out of those, once you've got them dialed in, it's, it's completely sick. And that for me that's is really is, cool. Is, yeah. The, the, and that's why we, we're looking at whether there's a way for us to kind of set up shop as a very rapid source of motion capture data because we have the system and it will be dialed in and ready to go. The hard bit is actually face capture. I say the hard bit. I mean, the impossible bit is yeah. very good face capture. But again, that's the kind of thing that you can dial in. And what I'm learning more and more is that this, the pace of the, the, the space that we're in, it doesn't support a six-month, 12-month development cycle. Actually, for us, we need to be writing in the morning, delivering in the afternoon. And that is, that's insane. And then you add motion capture and Unreal Engine and animation on top of that. You're just like, that's impossible. And that's where I go, no, no, no. We just need to learn how to do it. And we need to figure out how to do it fast. And, uh, and then and because we can do it, other people will do it. And then suddenly it'll all become a thing. But, you know, the only solution we could think of was that actually would, was good enough for us to, to be able to get 95% accurate was, was Vicon or Optitrack. Yeah, I mean, One of those two would have, been, would have been correct. You see this with every new technology that comes out, right? Like it, it becomes achievable for professionals to be able to stitch stuff together and it's difficult to work with. But then as you know, more and more experience working with the tools is accrued throughout the industry, the, then they become more simplified to the point where eventually people can just do it at home, you know? And I, I think we're going to see that uh, pretty rapidly now, especially with this advent of, you know, NFTs becoming a thing and the game industry really starting to pay attention to this. Now there's buyers for that type of stuff. So so I think that you're going to see that those those sorts of you know cottage or niche or nascent industries that are uh, tangentially related are going to start to come out into the forefront, right? A lot more companies are going to be spun up to to fulfill those needs. Yeah, it's very exciting. I always try and get on a stream and and like pilot some weird tech from Japan that allows you to like puppet things in real time, and like using a leap controller. I don't know if you remember that thing. Like this weird kind of block like that. And it's like 10 years old, but it's like it managed to make my hands move. And I'm like, how is it doing this? This is really old tech. Um, mm -hmm. And like Deep Face Live, these kind of things, Vroid Studio. And then the goal is to be able to interact with objects. So I could pick up a phone in real life, but it will be my phone in Unreal Engine. And I'll be able to like stream directly from that. I mean, this is this is where we want to go with it. Like just put everything in a virtual environment. The environmental cost of that's, it's significant like we uh we, we we don't need to go and shoot in the arctic or we don't need to shoot in the desert we can build the desert and be there and is the experience any different well the mandalorian says no you can absolutely 100 create 
on an LED stage using virtual production. So why not do that on a YouTube schedule and do it mm-hmm. fast? You know, that's 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 where we're going. Yeah, you know, um, the other problem you have is there's people like me who just are not going to put a camera in their living room. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, so you have to you have to put the camera in your eyeball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Brilliant. Well, listen, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and getting to know the project a bit better. And I think people will be surprised to hear the kind of depth of knowledge and talent that you have kind of putting this thing together. Um, so I really hope people, uh, you know, go and check you out and, and, and have a look at what you're building, because I, I think from everything I've heard, it's this idea of co-creation, outsource, outsourcing the writer's room really speaks to me. I have no idea how you do it. I have no idea how you wrangle it. Your community mods must hate you, but still, you know, it's a it's a bold and daring vision, and and you seem to be able to pull it off. So, congratulations. Thank you. I would say the best thing to do is just hop into the Discord. Uh, that is the best place to to find out all about what we're doing and even take part in this open sourcing of the writers' room and every other facet of developing this metaverse. It is uh, it's an exciting journey to be on. We should design you an app that listens to every time you say the word hop. And then donates like <laughs> 10 cents to charity. That would be an amazing thing I, in real time. Like, <laughs> you know, I will say the the frog puns just never stop. They never stop. <laughs> it's, I can yeah. imagine. Nor should so they. Many. So many. Well, listen. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for uh, for taking the time. Um, I really wish you all the best, and um, look forward to seeing what you cook up next. Thanks to Ed, to Matt, and to Daniel for joining us, and uh, hopefully see you sometime in the future. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. So that was Frogland, and what a pleasure that was, getting to see the game being played as well. So what we're moving on to next is, well, it's a project whose whose story is absolutely fascinating. It started with one of the kind of just craziest launches, craziest stories. They blew up massive. They were featured in the New Yorker, and then and then it just all went wrong. I am, of course, talking about the pudgy penguins, and here are the pudgies. Look at this little fellow. What a what a beauty. What a beauty. There was the whole kind of cold theorem incident. There was a whole load of controversy around them. And then the pudgies seem to be on a trajectory fast tracked to zero. But somehow indeed, a savior was born a long time ago and decided that Pudgy Penguins was going to be a place for him to park his car, his hat, his creative uh, energies. And that was really basically Luca Nets. And it is my great pleasure to be introducing the interview with Luca right now. And there's no sound. So why does this always happen? We always lose the sound on the interviews. Let's see if I can get the sound back. Beautiful. Uh... Yeah, this sucks every single time. Every single time I try and do one of these these interviews, something goes wrong. And I, I, for the life of me, cannot figure out what on earth it is. It is bizarre. So bear with me. Um, anyone want to get on the on the uh, the old uh, chat here and, and drop some questions? Ask me, who does my hair? Andy Needham says, good old windows. Ah, oh, you bastard. You bastard. You know what? This, this, this basically, this makes me feel like this. Right? Why can't I make the Luca interview work? Ribbit, ribbit every frog. You don't want to listen to me. You want to listen to Luca. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I did last time. So that should be right. That is correct. I got an explosion to play. And no, Luca. God damn it. It's so bizarre. Every single time. 
Monitor of Monitor. somewhere on the ice somewhere. Is that a fair assumption? It's Luca Ne. There we go. Got it to work. All right. Fine. Listen, people. Some of okay, so uh, let's try and do that again, shall we? It's Pudgy Penguins time. Pudgies, yow. Big up yourselves. Pudgies, amazing community, doing some amazing things. What a resurgence they have had, a renaissance of a project that have kind of won everyone's hearts over with how cute they are. And now, finally, we will get to hear from the man himself, Luca Nets. So listen, people, someone very important has joined us here. He's a man with a mission. The mission is to resurrect the Pudgy Penguins from where they were, which was in the dirt, to a place of solitude and tranquilness somewhere on the ice somewhere. Is that a fair subject? It's Luca Nets. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Robin. I appreciate the time. So listen, Luca, I think we should start, before we get into Pudgies, to learn a little bit about you and your journey through NFTs and where you came from, um, because it's a pretty interesting story. Can you give us a little bit of a background on, on you? Yeah, so without going, you know, boring everybody listening, long story short, I uh, grew up all over the world, not because we wanted to, but because we had to. We were kind of just staying at people's houses who would let us stay. So couches and guest bedrooms and whatever, you know, space was available at the time because we didn't really have, you know, um, a lockdown location. Uh, we then moved to Los Angeles where I went to high school. I went to Fairfax High School two years into going to Fairfax. I dropped out because I just needed to make money for my mom. She was airbnb the house and we only had a one bedroom apartment and we were sleeping in the living room and it just wasn't something that to me uh was i just couldn't bear it anymore so i dropped out of school i started working at a company called ring uh i then moved into selling solar over the phone and then from there i was you know got into e-commerce and you know within the span of four or five years i have a couple hundred million dollars under my belt and terms of revenue that I've generated for, you know, my companies. And that's kind of the story. And I just want to apologize ahead of time, I'm kind of lethargic, just because I'm like, feel so bad. Uh, so just apologize. But what was it? What was it that you were really good at? Because you must have been good at something. Was it sales? Was it connecting people? What was your core skill there? It was marketing, right? So one thing that I've always been good at is just exposure and getting millions of people to see something. I was never the best branding guy. I was never the best operations guy. And all of my businesses, I always had a lot of partners. Like I never had 100% of anything. I rarely even had 50% of something. Uh, my role was really just putting people together and making millions of people see something. That's what I was really good at. And I tended to put operators and people in these businesses to do the rest. But that that's like kind of my core skill set. And when, when we talk about marketing, I think there's a very unsophisticated notion of what marketing is, which is like, it's like nobody knows about something and now they do. But actually, I think there's a lot more to it than that. And I think it boils down to understanding what it is that you are selling inside and out and then understanding what it is that someone on the other side of that equation really doesn't know that they want to hear. Is that sort of getting there close? Yeah, I think it's like a, a multifaceted approach. It's one, it's like educating a consumer, it's getting them to be familiar with your product. But even like further than that, it's getting them to purchase and to become a part of your community in whatever capacity that it is, whether I'm selling clothes, whether I'm selling, uh, you know, some sort of product, a toy. Uh, it's really just about like the whole process, right? And getting somebody to fall in love with what you're doing. I think marketing is just as much customer experience as, as it is anything else. Uh, you know, my job is not only, you know, purchasing and acquiring the customer, but retaining them. Uh, if you can't retain, then eventually your customer, you keep buying, you know, a new customer every time and your business eventually will come to an end. So my business, you know, my skill set is really just exposure and retention. That's what the two things that I think I'm really good at. And do, do you have a, a secret box of tricks for doing that? Yeah, I do. So I have, I have like a little hyper proprietary method that I, yeah, I, I no. For the sake of, uh, for the sake of just me having a competitive edge, I won't share it. But some people know what I do. But 
I have a, I have a process that I've rinsed and repeated a couple of times now and every time it works. So now like, I'm just like super comfortable in how I can flow and how I can do things. Uh, and I just have this step one through five process that I feel like there's very few businesses. I can't come and use this process and I can't turn around. So, so I think one of the, the things that you notice about the crypto space particularly is that everyone's kind of riding the hype train and there's yeah. hype that moves from place to place and, and all over the place. So it feels like if you have this skill set, then it would work very well for a, a, a space that is driven so much by hype. It, so how did you get into NFTs? What was that journey in here? Yeah, so, you know, I was buying Top Shots and I really loved this young kid named Ferocious. Uh, but it wasn't until like one of my friends, I saw something on Twitter with a pudgy penguin. But hang on, uh, this, this, was, this was 2020 you were buying Ferocious and Top Shots or were you a little bit later? Yeah, no, I was really early. I think it was like right when the hype was. I don't remember the exact dates, but it was probably like if Pudgy Penguins was July, August, I was probably ferocious and uh, top shot like maybe April, March, April. <laughs> right? I, love it. I love it. You say early. I love you say early. It's like, yeah, it's that early. Is that not early? April, no, like early is like 2017. Like crypto, oh, okay. yeah, crypto yeah, kitties totally. and like ethermons. That that's like that's early. Oh yeah, um, I'm totally then, not early. Then. Yeah, I know. But so so if you if you talk to someone like Pranksy, for instance, he he was like really busy and really active 2020, and there was a whole kind of open sea explosion. We had Blue Kirby and all the craziness, and then we had Trevor Jones and Ferocious, a whole bunch of and the Hacker Tower, all all these you know exciting NFT artists, and then we hit board ape and me bits and all these kind of things. So when you say early, yeah, I mean, that's hilarious. But I'm I mean, that's, sorry. that's, that's, no, but it's, that's where we are, man. It's, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a symptom of where we are. So you were, you, you, you were a pudgy. Yeah. Before you so were I, an owner. Yeah. So I saw on Twitter, the whole pudgy penguins thing, and I wasn't really familiar with the apes, but I ended up buying a ton of these pudgies instantly when I saw them, I knew they were going to be huge. And I kind of was upset that I missed the board apes and the crypto punks. You know, I got somebody was telling me to buy punks when they were like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, like, you know, months before. And so I, I saw the craze happening and I thought cereals at the time uh, dictated rarity. So I was buying all the low serial numbers on pudgies. I just didn't know. And like rarity tools didn't make any sense to me at the time. I spent like maybe like once I bought pudgies and the next day they went like I bought them for like 0.1 and like two days later they were like four or five Ethereum. So like, you know, usually when you do something and like I'd lost money on Top Shot, I didn't ferocious. I wasn't in the business of making money. I was in the business of getting like, you know, uh, a digital frame and like hanging it like that. You know, I was never in the business of flipping. But once I saw what pudgies did, I completely like fell in love. Like I was like, Oh my God, you know, and I had like 20, 30 pudgies at the time that gave me the liquidity to buy into apes and to buy into punks and to buy into everything else. And that's what kind of kicked it all off. So when the opportunity came to buy pudgy, I kind of felt a responsibility, you know, pudgy had made me so much money and made me fall in love with web three that like, I felt like I had an obligation to use my skill set to kind of return the favor, you know? So what was it about pudgies that, that you fell in love with? You no, know, there's a unique phenomenon that I experience when looking at pudgies, but I just like smile. And I think that's like a unique characteristic and a unique emotion to feel when you look at something. And when scrolling through my open sea, if I have thousands of things there, when I go through my pudgies, I feel a really good and positive emotion. And so from a branding perspective and an entrepreneurial perspective, you know, leaning into things that make people feel good, it's like, you know, the product almost sells itself. And so, you know, when I first bought into them, I just knew like you had happy feet, you had club penguin, like what's our generations, you know, penguin hype. Uh, I, I had just like instantly resonated with it. I knew, you know, it was, it was unintimidating. It radiated inclusivity. Uh, it just had a plethora of like really awesome characteristics that I thought could make it number one. Unfortunately, at the time, the operators behind the project just didn't have the skill set to take it to where it needed to be. Uh, but that's why we're we're here today. Yeah, and, and it was such a strange journey the, the penguins went on because they they seem to, as you say, encapsulate this 
this and this, this counter board ape narrative i think that was what it was the board apes felt kind of aggressive and very degenerate and the project was sort of this sort of soft and very inclusive collection but i mean it wasn't like we were short of them at the time cool cats also came along and took a little piece of that sort of sensitivity as well but i think you know i'm looking at the timeline here i think the mint was like 0 0.03 ETH, so really in the grand scheme of things pretty cheap yeah. and alexis hanian bought one Kevin Roos wrote a New York Times article on them. And then suddenly we were just inundated with pudgy penguins everywhere. And as you rightly said, th there was a character behind all this that some of us, and I include myself in that, had suspicions about. And that was one of the reasons I didn't go anywhere near pudgy penguins is because of Coltherium. So what was your, I mean, feel free to, to say, well, I don't really want to talk about that, but I, I'm curious what your, your business brain, which is always active, I'm sure, was telling you about the project and whether you had any red flags or things that you were you were feeling uncertain about yeah so at the time you know i was i definitely not somebody to judge somebody by like their age and experience figuring like that was the stigma against me and my career for so long and like i'm never one to bet against the horse because you know it's younger or less experienced you know i feel like that was kind of my stigma and the taboo behind me and so like i actually felt excited that, that it was a bunch of young kids and young hustlers like it actually motivated me i didn't dive deeper but the space was so new at the time like nobody had proven that like core competency was doing it to me it was just like art and identity like utility wasn't really a question uh but i can tell you as time went on and i saw you know you go do what they did i was getting really upset at cole and i had bought so many of these things and i i definitely was you know, one of those angry pitchfork guys. But then when I met them and I talked to them, my narrative actually changed. So like, I, you, you met, you, did you meet them? Did you meet them in person? No, but like on Zoom and stuff, okay. you know, and talk to them, like we didn't meet in person. But when, when, when I got to know them and we spent hours on the phone, like, you know, talking and answering questions and getting their perspective, like my my whole narrative shifted i just started to empathize because like at the end of the day like they got lucky you know right place right time with really magical art and those guys aren't operators they're not businessmen they never sold people like they were businessmen they're a bunch of kids in their college dorm rooms like playing video games you know like they like this responsibility was like not something they necessarily knew or signed up for and back when they started there was no like founding principles in the space like it was really new and there really was no expectation today if you start a project it's completely different but back when they did it they were like one of the first pfp projects like what you didn't know what you were signing up for you thought you were just making you know some little penguins and you know 0 0.03 eth like it's not a big deal and in, in terms of like you know it's art right and so I don't know. I met them and I was somebody who was really angry with them in the beginning. But like today, I just like empathize. And I know that if any, if most people who criticize them were in their shoes, you probably would have came to the same conclusion. Mine is hatching, you know, fishing rods and eggs. I think that's the only exception that I don't think most of us would come to. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because you, the, you go set the template for so many of the things that projects have done. And it's been very difficult for projects to to go their own path in a sense and be innovative and be different because the, the communities want them to repeat what other projects have done. And you can only keep repeating that formula ad nauseum. Yeah. And so, you know, the, there comes a point where you go, well, you know what, I, I, I'm not best equipped. So to their credit, they, they realized this. I mean, there, were, there was a bunch of stuff. We don't really need to go over why that stuff was unusual and weird, but did you find yourself getting angry again when that stuff started to come to the surface. I'm specifically talking about Cole Peter, Darth, and the the random community manager, and then like the this sort of strange buyback that they proposed. Like where where was your head at, at this point? Yeah. So I mean, where I, where the like the straw ended for me was the rogs and the and the eggs. You know, I'm somebody who's held apes since like August. Like I was never one that like sat in the discord for hours like I was always just too busy but like I have all of these screens like if you know behind this camera I have like eight screens so like I'm in the whole game but like I was never one to like 
you know, sit in the discord for hours and get hip to the drama. I was just, you know, I saw the nine X thread about like buying it out and, you know, you know, I, I really got fed up with the rogs, with the fishing rogs and the eggs, you know, beyond that, I just wasn't too involved in, in terms of like sitting in the discord and figuring out what things were. But, you know, I talked to cold pizza. Like, I like all those guys, like all those guys are like cool to me, you know, and, you know, there's obviously some issues with people in the community that, you know, others have had, but, you know, thankfully for me, like, you know, ever since I've taken over, they've been all really, really kind and supportive. But, you know, my final straw with the whole pudgy penguins was the, was the, I was waiting for months to hatch these eggs and I got freaking fishing rods. I was livid. Like that was, that was when I put the nail in the coffin. Wait, I, I'm trying to remember now. Were, were you, were you vocal on, on Twitter about pudgy penguins at this point? Did you know? I was. I was vocal on Instagram. So oh, okay. one of the people that we've hired or that was been a part of the team for a while named agents, I would message all over the Instagram and I would DM like the Instagram. I'd be like, you guys are like so dumb. Like what's going on over here? Like I have almost a million dollars in pudgy penguins. Like you guys need to get your act together. You know, like what is this nonsense? Let me help. Like, let me, let me do what I do, you know? Uh, and it just fell on deaf ears, but you know, thankfully we're here today. You know, it's fine. Let me do what I do. Do you know, yeah. do you, I, I suspect they probably just didn't know what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I try to tell them, you know, like I try to point them in the right direction, but you know, that was the thing. There was a lot of people trying to help them at the time. So they didn't know who was serious and who was the real deal and who wasn't. Uh, but you know, the opportunity came to buy it and I was like, well, I'm over here complaining to them when they put my money where my mouth is, you know? Yeah. And I, that, so then January 20. 22 we've got like cola promised a game a token an educational book on nfts and a, and a bunch more and it just wasn't wasn't coming so then we, we get to this this offer of a buyout um you were not the only one looking to, to get involved how is it that you ended up being the chosen one yeah, so I just saw Beanie and all of these guys posting about making offers for pudgy penguins. And I thought, look, like, you know, these guys, I think, you know, are super smart and super talented. But what I've kind of derived with an NFT project and, and its success is brand building. And I've also, you know, was in a company called Gel Blaster, the toy business. You know, I just got in the toy business the last 12 months. And, and like, I just knew like right then and there that like I could make this work. You know, like I, I know that my skill set is perfectly primed to take this, you know, IP and turn it into what I hope to be a multi-billion dollar company. And I knew that the other guys making the bids, I didn't really feel strongly about in terms of their integrity, one, and two, their ability to really make this happen. So it was almost really strange because I had, you know, about a couple hours before I actually made the bid. I had just come back from Sedona and I did a spiritual retreat to kind of figure out where life would take me. Uh, Cause I was always in the business of making money. I was really good at making money, but I, you know, wasn't really building anything that like had everlasting impact. And as I leave Sedona, uh, you know, I'm reading these tweets and it's almost like my, my hands take over my mind and I just like make the bit. And Cole wasn't taking me seriously, but two weeks before I'd met a guy named Levi. And Levi was really good friends with Cole. And he was like, yo, Cole, Luke is serious. And Cole was like, look, like, I'll sell it to you if you're the guy. And I was like, let's make it happen. That was it. That was it. That was it. That was I mean, it. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I remember was, I was really surprised it was you. Because I, I was pretty sure that the, I think Zach from Mintable put a pretty good bit in. Um, yeah. I was pretty sure he was going to get it. But like, you... I guess you you have probably more of the the hustle that a project like this needed to 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 really come back because it was it was it was really going to the dogs. Yeah, and I think it was like dude, like I don't know, you know what you believe in, but it's like it's almost like God or the universe or whatever you choose like wanted me to have this. It's like very strange how it aligned. And you know, the issue is with Zach like he probably would have got it, 
if he wasn't just being like so mean like dude he was like all over the place being like an ass and i'm like dude what's your problem like you don't need to put people down to like i don't i would i never need to put somebody else down to show you my worth like i don't need to like play that game of you know putting somebody else down to put myself up and that's all he was doing and it's like it almost seemed like a conflict of interest with mintable and it's like what are you really doing this for are you doing this for yourself or are you doing this for the people you know uh and like you know the dude is incredibly bright incredibly smart and you're probably way smarter than i'll ever be but you know at the end of the day like creating a successful brand and providing value to your holders doesn't you know isn't dependent on your iq or how smart you are there's a plethora of other skills and other traits that you need uh to build something successful like this so i, I think i think he would have won it if he would have just been kind truly like if he would have just been like cool but instead he was like consistently putting everyone else down it's like dude no one wants this you keep mentioning these these words around kindness and mindfulness and it yeah. seems to me that that's always been as as cringe as it was at certain times my penguin is me and i am my penguin these things do seem to represent something that is meaningful for people and yeah. In a way, that represents the best of what a PFP project can be. But when these things go toxic, that goes away. And then it's your job to kind of revive it and put the, the feel good back in. So what, what was your first order of business when you took over? Yeah, so I think like in terms of the brand cohesiveness, it was all over the place. So like step one, when I came in was like, build a foundation because the foundation sucked. Right. So like on Twitter, we were pudgy dot penguins and on Instagram, we were pudgy underscore penguins. And on TikTok, we didn't have a TikTok. So the first order of business was I secured the original usernames at pudgy penguins. So there's alignment, there's cohesiveness. I got them verified. You know, I put the right brand tools in place, figured out what our messaging was, what our primary and secondary fonts, our logos, just like all of the things that you need when creating a brand, like they had none of that, right? And so for somebody who's built multiple brands over the last couple of years, you need these decks and like this cohesiveness and these SOPs, like, you know, a lot of it was infrastructure stuff. And even more so than that, it was interesting because we were doing all of this. Typically you have like downtime and like ample time to do this, but we were building a bullet train on a moving train. So it's been really difficult up until this point, uh, just because it's like you have a market to uh, kind of appease, as well as you have to like take the necessary steps to conduct best practice, to build the necessary foundation necessary to scale. You know, our situation is different. We didn't have all pre-mint to figure all these things out in ample time. You know, I'm coming in and revamping the whole thing while the thing's already running while having to be transparent, while having to communicate, uh, while having to hire, like, you know, our operation, I don't know how other people are running their operations, but, you know, we have HR, we have an insurance, like, you know, healthcare, dental, like, you know, eyesight, like, we're running this like a real company, like, we're not running this, like, I, you know, everybody's on payroll, getting wires, like, you know, there is no, like, I'm not sending you Ethereum for your payment, like, I just can't, right, like, like, we're building, like, we're trying to build something real and tangible. Right. And like with that, it like takes a lot of time. Like these are not things that you can snap of a finger, but because the space is so quickly, you know, half of us have been working on setting up that infrastructure and the other half has been like, you know, building the lore and the utility and, you know, trying to bridge the partnerships and do things that are quote unquote value adds for holders. So it's been a blend. We're almost at the finish line in terms of like setting this thing up, but it's been really tough, dude. Like it's been a while since I've had a challenge and, it's really just a bandwidth challenge because I like I just feel exhausted. It's like nine different things that are necessary that usually you would have months to figure out and no pressure to do so. And this is not the case. Yeah, and, and you have a rampaging horde of of degenerates who are chasing after every tiny tit bit of information from you because they believe that's going to be the secret source that launches them to, you know, competitiveness with mutants or with doodles or with azukis and all of those projects are blowing up in their own right and they're putting pressure on you because your little tadpoles are going, but it's really nice over there. Why does it, why isn't it so nice over here? And what are you going to do about it? Luca, it's all your fault. I hate you, but I love you really. Cause I'm a pudgy yeah. every, no, I mean, every five minutes. It's that. That that's why, you know, that's why I kind of like, I'm super excited that we're in this little bear market right now because the expectation is not on me. If everything's down 50%. And I also really, you know, I've been preaching this for a while, but 
I think these type of moments are really going to show who's really a builder and who isn't. And, you know, my experiences in building, you know, nine figure web two brands, uh, like this gives us a huge moment to lean into that side of the business uh, because that's what's going to sustain cash flow until we're in a bull market again, right? Like a lot of people are basing their whole entire project's futures over off of royalties. And like, I'm not in the business to do that. Like I'm very confident that we can build multiple nine figure streams of income with this IP. Uh, and I think the bear market's kind of been a blessing for us in that regard because the expectation is nominal right now. And this is really where we have a huge opportunity to get on a sprint. So uh, I'm personally really enjoying it because I think people are going to catch on. You know, a lot of people think to themselves, well, I want to invest in a project that I know is going to be around long term. And, you know, with my situation, it's like, dude, I just spent two and a half million dollars for this IP. Like, I'm not going to go just leave six months from now because things are getting tough. Like, I'm really committed to this for the next five to 10 years. Like, I have to continuously work on this uh, until it's successful, until it's like, you know, where I want it to be. Cause I really have no other choice. It's not like I have, like, I come pre mint, I make a couple million dollars. I fulfill the roadmap and do the bare minimum on the expectation. Like if people, you know, and I think people understand that, you know, like I'm not in here for sh creating short-term catalysts. I could really honestly care less. Uh, and if the floor suffers because of, because of it in the short term, that's fine. Cause in the long term, we'll win, you know, like I'm in, I'm here for the next five years. So I have to make my decision based on five year thinking I can't make my decision on six to 12 month thinking and appeasing the crowd because at the end of the day, I have two and a half million dollars on the line. Like I have to make this work and I have to make this win. You know, like, it's just like, it's a, like, there's no, there's no world where this, we don't win in this, you know, project, you know? So um, it, it's, you know, it's been a balance. We're, well, we're waking up to the era of not anonymous and has track record because in, in the great DeFi summer, literally projects were saying anonymous was, was a plus point. And now I think everyone realizes like, mm, I'm not sure whether that's necessarily a good thing. I, I was literally before our call was reading the latest NFT ethics thing where they've doxed Zagabond. And it turns out Zagabond's actually a legit web three builder creator and has a ton of, um, a ton of pedigree as it turns out. And well, well done everyone for doxing him, but you're known and your track record is, is known. So I think Pudgies are actually pretty lucky to have you in a, in a way. I appreciate it. And, you know, I just, I don't, don't think it's okay for people to do that against people's will. I mean, I have my own opinion on that, but I will say this, you know, I've, you know, part of my passion over the last couple of years has been venture capital you would never invest money into somebody, into a company where you don't know who the person is. You would never do it. And in hindsight, I mean, like, thank God apes turned out okay because I spent a fortune there. But in hindsight, it is probably the most foolish investment, like, like, like you, from an investment standpoint, like investing in something where you don't know who the people are has to be like breaking investment 101, like rule number one. Like it has to be one of like the most foolish things that you can do. And thank God apes worked out okay. But like, and like I made a lot of mistakes, you know, throwing money at these people. And I just don't think it's the right way to do it. Like it's, it's fiscally irresponsible to throw your hard earned money at something where you don't know who's behind it. Like you would never do that in the real world. And you shouldn't do that in web three. Like web three is like hiding behind a non, like being anonymous. Like it's just like, it's like bullshit, you know, to me, like, it's just like totally not okay. Well, no, it has a name and its name is gambling. That's yeah. what it is. And we're, you know, yeah. people speculate and they, they want to say we're, I'm an investor and they want to pretend like they're investors because then they go, yeah, but what are you going to say to investors? You're not an investor. You're a speculator. You're just gambling. Yeah. Like own that. That's fine. And if you are in, you know, gambling on something turning out well, then accept that it is a gamble. And that is, that is one of the hardest things for people to really wrap their heads around is that they don't know anything. And the quicker they get to that, opinion and understand that that is where they're at the better but I'm, I'm curious you talked about venture capital you are an investor what is the what, what is it that you look for in an investment yeah and it's crazy you bring this up because i was just talking to my friend about it earlier to me it's all about the founder i found i've invested in all the businesses that i've won and all the businesses that i've lost there was one key caveat it was the person. 
it, you know, you can have a bullshit idea, you know, and like have a crazy operator and it will work. And what I found now is I just invest in people. I don't invest in, you know, ideas or any of the above. I either believe in you or I don't. And if I do, I'll put my money where my mouth is. And if I don't, then hopefully you prove me wrong and make me rue the day that I should have believed in you. But I quantified, I've made 17 venture capital investments in the last two and a half years. Every single one that has failed or gone belly up, the guy, there was a red flag about the guy that I should have caught ahead of time. Everything that has done well, dudes were all stars. Dudes and women were all stars. Uh, so I think for me, like the simplest thing is just like investing. And like, do I believe in the person or do I don't? You know, like the idea is obviously important and these things play a factor. And, you know, you know, but like, I don't care if you have the most genius idea ever. If you don't have, you know, proper operators, it doesn't mean anything to me. Just looking to your, your feed on Twitter. Obviously, the gel blaster. I have two young kids. Like, I, I want it. <laughs> I want, I want, I want everyone in the office. I want everyone in the office to have one. <laughs> I will send you. I will. You send me the office address. I'll send you twenty. Oh my god, you are amazing. Um, but no, I, the, the bit that I noticed. Let me see if I can find it. You're talking about how the pudgy IP will be how kids learn about Web three. That resonates yeah. with me. Yeah. So, yeah, Pudgy Penguins will lead the way in teaching the younger generation about Web3. Bookmark this. Is that a clue to where you think Pudgy IP can go? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, we've done focus groups now, you know, internally with our friends and family. And you put, you print out a bunch of pictures of NFT projects and you put a penguin, a Pudgy Penguin there. Eight out of 10 times, the kid is going to say, I like that Pudgy Penguin you know, other than like over a board ape or these other projects. And this is just internal focus groups that we've done, you know, and all of us have, you know, nieces and nephews and sons and daughters that we've done this with. We're like a team of 20 people. So I was one of the things that I kind of required of these guys. I don't know, they're just unintimidating. And like, you know, Happy Feet and Club Penguin brought that younger generation in. And I just feel like, you know, there is, they're, they're so PG, like there's nothing like, you know, that marginalizes IP, whether you're a man or a woman, you can resonate with the penguin, right? No matter what your ethnicity is, you can resonate with the penguin. No matter what your age is, you can resonate with the penguin. Like it to me, and this is my opinion and kind of the reason why I bought it, I think it's the most inclusive IP in the space. I really do. I don't think, I don't think anybody, you know, with maybe like an exception of one or two projects, but like, I don't think anybody is in a position where, like, we can be the brand that you're taught in schools, you know, like, we, we can, we can totally be that, you know, there's nothing like pointing us away from that direction. And we have a bunch, of, and I'm not hiding it, we have a bunch of educational tools and a huge education initiative. Uh, you know, I want Pudgy Penguins to be, you know, an education company just as much as anything else. Now, it's important that I work chronologically, and I don't spread myself too thin trying to do 10 different things. But there's going to be a time. There's going to be a time and place where you know there's a platform that is Pudgy Penguins, and it will be teaching young kids about NFTs. I totally think we're positioned to do that, and I don't think anybody else is positioned to do that. Truly, I don't. Uh, so again, it's just a matter of just you know operating in the proper fashion and you know doing what's necessary. But you know, to me, you know, there's cool and inclusive, and I think that's amazing, and that's a multi-billion-dollar industry. But I think cute and inclusive is uh, an industry that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. I think there's more upside in cute and inclusive than there is in cool and exclusive. And that's just my take. So it's really interesting that you're saying this because I watch my kids play Roblox. And I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit, I've been mean, like, I don't quite know what they get up to, but they're communicating with their friends and they're, they're, they're using it. They play Minecraft a lot as well. But I'm totally with you on this. Like, what would I be happy with them watching? There's, there's a couple of shows on Netflix that are really good about explaining stuff. Um, really, really good. And so much of what we do on the show here is like we have to take very complicated, very abstract concepts and render them in terms that are kind of simple and easy. And generally what we do is we just turn them into fruit and we just like we take things that are physical and we make those metaphors for the actual things. But like I'm looking at the pudgy penguins and I'm talking to you right now. And I'm buying one right now. I bought yeah. one. I bought one like 20 minutes ago when we first started talking, because Thank I you. want in. I want in because I, I I fully I fully get 
this educational thing and I fully understand where you're coming from. And I wasn't sure from the outside because I wasn't part of the pudgy journey. But I'm I'm like I, I want to be part of that journey. I want to be I want to be in and I want to be helping educate because I see I see the end result in my own kids and they love NFTs. Oh my God. They love them so much, but they don't love them for money. They love them because they just think they're the best things to look at. And they're like, whoa, what did we get? Is, is that my one? Is that my one? And I've, I've been screwing away NFTs to keep in a vault for when they're like 18. And, you know, some of them will probably be worthless, but some of them, who knows, you know? And um, so now I'm like, I, I, I could see it. I could see the IP. I can see where you're going with that. But I, but I, I, I really want to know what else you've got cooking because I, I'm I'm so intrigued by by you and your position in this IP. I'm I'm yeah, intrigued. So I'll I'll dive in with you, but now that you're a Pudgy Penguin holder, I want you to now feel responsible for what we're doing. And it's important I say this because if you go to the Instagram and you see the content that we're pushing out and all the comments, like now that you're a Pudgy Penguin holder, I tell all the holders this. But like you'll see all these comments of people saying, "Wow, you helped my day. Wow, I needed this." I want you now, Robin, to feel responsible for that because that's what it is to be a pudgy penguin. And so check out our content on Instagram at pudgy penguins. And when you see all of these amazing comments of people being impacted in a positive way, I want you to feel responsible for that. Beyond, you know, just the education side, I think there's a huge, you know, penguins were promised a game and they will get a game. I'll tell you that. And the game is going to be epic. And I plan on making the best game in the space. To me, play to earn has been really interesting because I think they've done all, the concept is fantastic, but they're lacking in one major place. And that is all the play to earn that I've played thus far is boring. And it's not a game if it's boring, you know? Like you won't yeah. win, you'll never get adoption. And so I plan on making the most fun game uh, that the space has seen. And so that's, you know, one thing that I'm really leaning on. That's a big claim. You know that, right? Like oh, the dude, most. Ready. You're ready, but I, again, I mean, I mean the, the kids thing. Like they play the crappiest games on Roblox. I mean, they're garbage, but they love them, and they love them because they can just do it together. And like they're sitting next to each other and they're playing. In the, oh God, it's you learn so much just from watching kids play games. It's every day. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I I didn't know that that was what it was like. But it's it's it's, it's so important. So. But anyway, I'm 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 gonna w wait and see what you do. So I'm looking at the content on Instagram. It's very wholesome. Who does your art? How, do you have a, like an in-house team that's doing specifically this with you? Yeah, yeah, we do, and we also hired the original artist who was kind of thrown to the curb by the original team. So he's involved now as well. You know, the Instagram stuff he's not really playing a role in. That's kind of we have a uh, you know it's Jake and Peter who are doing that. Uh, but you know, the concept is just like, you know, impacting people in a positive way. And, you know, like being that beacon of light, you know, NFTs in all of its glory have one fatal con and that's the toll it takes on your mental health. And I found that the content that you consume dictates how you think. And Instagram and Twitter can be a really toxic place if the content that you're consuming, uh, you know, is toxic. And so at least at a minimum, if you know you're following pudgy penguins, you'll get a little bit of positive content on your feed uh, every single day. And that's really important to me because, you know, the space is phenomenal, but, you know, it does have a major, major flaw and like people need to analyze this and be conscious of it. Like it can be really negative for people. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that project at a bare minimum, right? You know that when you buy a pudgy penguin and your royalties, you know, go to the, to the company wallet, you know, that that money is being spent on the content that you're looking at. And you can feel good about that because like, dude, we're growing two, three, 4,000 followers a day on Instagram right now. Like people are resonating with that. You know, it's like really being shared at the highest form. And so like, that's important. Like if, what, what is this? You know what I mean? Like, what is this to people? Is this a place just to make money? Is this a place to empower people? Like to me, NFTs is the beginning of a bottom up economy, right? It, typically throughout our history and if you know art has been subjugated to a top-down economy where a bunch of guys at the top you know exploit the creations of creators like i'm in the business of pushing web 3 
Like to me, you know, it's important that Pudgy Penguins has millions of followers on Instagram because that's what's going to bring people on to Web3. Like Web3 has to succeed. You know, I would love Pudgy Penguins to be number one, but if we aren't for some reason, like at least I can look back at it and say like we were a huge reason as to why this space succeeded. It's bigger than just me, dude, and bigger than just Pudgy Penguins. Like Web3 has to succeed for the sake of shifting the paradigm that has enslaved creators for so long. You know, for hundreds, thousands of years, you know, people have been exploited for their art forms and haven't been able to monetize properly off of their creations. You know, obviously you have some bad actors in the space, but in general, you're empowering people like Ferocious. It's funny, my friend Tommy, four years ago, was going to buy a Ferocious painting for $200. Now the kid's making $20, $30 million. He's a boy a genius. You know, like that doesn't happen without Web3, and he deserves that. You know, if I sell a painting for $1,000 and it resells five years later for $100 million, I should reap some of those benefits. You know, like it's just basic human, you know, kindness and and like like it's just what it is to be a human. That's why crypto is amazing. I should be able to send money to somebody without a middleman. That's just like a basic human right. You know, me monetizing off my creations as an artist is a basic human right. Web3, it's important for me to succeed, for it to succeed for me, for the sake of that it's a basic human right that you should be able to create something and monetize off of it for the lifetime of its like of it being around. So to me, it's just like way bigger than, you know, me or Pudgy or Yuga or any of these guys. Like it's important that this succeeds and like, where's the gap that needs to be filled? Nobody's taking a stance in web three as being that beacon of light. No one's owning that, you know, like how is it nobody's owning, you know, being positive and being good in a space that's, you know, literally about positivity and doing good and empowerment. You know, I want to own that. If no one else is going to own that, the penguins will own it. And I think time will tell that we will be one of the projects that win because of it. Yeah, I see you. You're very passionate about that. I mean, I think there's a huge number of things in this space that we don't know about yet. But I think that's also why it's so exciting. We are going to be the architects of the rules upon which millions of teenagers build their dreams. And that really is an exciting place to be. And I think we will, the best thing we can do is throw all the things that we know out the window and jump in with both feet. But I think like you've got this really good balance between being able to use all the things you already do know and use them as kind of support struts for things so that the experiments can happen at greater speed and with greater confidence. And I think that's a really interesting, there's a really interesting structure I've not come across before. Um, a lot of VCs or, or larger players come in in a very predatory way that they want to kind of hoover up something and then sort of just you know, do enough and then set on its way. But I really feel like you, you kind of, you want to take this somewhere meaningful. What do you think Web3 or the metaverse is, is lacking right now that isn't what Pudgy Penguins can provide? What, what, do, you, what do you think are the, the big kind of opportunities potentially for someone to come and, come and take ownership of? That's an interesting one. I think, I think the metaverse, I think, Oh, that's a great question. What lacks? Repeat that question for me one more time as I think about it. Do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. So if, as we look at the landscape opening up in front of us, you have to kind of have a picture of where you're going. And that's not about YouTube and Twitter and Instagram. It's about Web3 and the metaverse. We don't really know what that is yet, but I think there's there are certain things that are missing that will enable us to get there. And I, I have a few ideas about what those are. I'm happy to share them, but I'm curious whether you think that way in terms of this doesn't exist yet, we're going to have to create it in order to get where we need to get. That's what, that's kind of where I'm digging around yeah. at the moment. Non, I mean, one of the topics in the headlines right now is Elon buying Twitter and the act of free speech. I don't think there's a place right now where you can speak freely, positively or negatively. I think that's really important. Uh, I think there's also a place that I haven't seen it yet, but when you look at, you know, web three right now the artists the the people who draw and the people who create you know on photoshop they're being rewarded but there's a lot of other type of artists that haven't been able to get a you know a platform to monetize whether you're an author or a storyteller or a musician right i don't think those platforms have yet to be created at a level like how OpenSea or magic eden has been created so interested to see that so i think 
from to answer your question, I think there's a platform of free speech, you know, truly free, whether that's positive or negative and no censorship that I think is yet to be created, a place that empowers musicians in a very clean and concise way, the way OpenSea did, right? Like I was on Foundation and Nifty Gateway forever, but it was OpenSea's UX UI that cooked everyone, right? Uh, and is there a place for storytellers? And you could argue that maybe that's, you know, what, what we have now, but I still don't think storytellers and authors have been rewarded in the way that I li would like to see them be rewarded. So those are kind of my three. And beyond that, you know what I think the, the space needs? I think the space needs more leaders. And you could say that I might, I'm trying to be one, but like when you think about web three leaders, who do you think about? Okay, so this is, I have, I, I, this is one of my absolute most favorite things to talk about is Web3 leadership. Because you're absolutely right. There are, there are human beings who come across like cult leaders. And it's a very, very thin line from being inspirational and somebody who really understands a space and can, can rally troops to being a cult leader. And we've seen yeah. it with Do Kwan. Do Kwan, at one point, he made that transition and it happened, I think, last year when UST first depegged and everyone attacked him. And then it it repegged. And I think in that moment, he became a megalomaniac. And, and like you see it in his tweets, it's crazy. Charles Hoskinson presents like a cult leader. There's one really good instance of someone who doesn't, and that's Gavin Wood of Polkadot. He somehow always manages to retain you know, a, a good, strong leadership style, but he's introverted. It's not really his natural place. So I, I'm, I'm completely with you. And like, I, but I want to see this kind of separated from influencers. Influencers have a different style of leadership and it's, it's, it's very engineered, but that kind of natural leadership. Yeah. There, there's, there, there's very few, very, very few indeed. And they, they become so quickly either exhausted or perverted by the system in which they find themselves and they take a wrong turn and then it's done. You have to be super careful about, you know, who you interact with and how you do things. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I could write a whole book about it. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Me too. And that, that's where I think there needs to be more people stepping in, you know, and that's where I, I hopefully I can be one of those guys that fills those vo that void, you know, one of, you know, because one guy can't fill the void. You need, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 men and women to do it. But, you know, when you think about Web3 leadership, nobody comes to mind. You know, and you can't say that anybody at Yuga or, or whatever, I don't even know their names, you know, like Corgan or whatever, you know, like you can't like their CEO. I've never even seen what their CEO looks like. I think that's a flaw. Like how, how have I not seen your CEO speak before? Like, that's not okay. You know, she's a woman, like, you know that, right? Yeah, I know she's a woman, but like, I don't even know what she looks like. Like, you know, like how You're, you guys just raised 450 million at a $4.5 billion valuation, like go and, you know, speak somewhere, you know, like. I don't know. It's strange to me. Like it's like in, in the, and you know, there's some things that we can't leave in web two. Like we can't just say, Oh, because it's web three, we're creating a whole different narrative. Like, you know, having just because like, this is a new space and it's web three and not web two doesn't mean you can't have like your CEOs being vocal leaders. Like that's not how that works. You know, like that, that shouldn't be left in web two. That should be moved to web three. Like you have to have that. If not, it's just like, it's just very strange to me. I don't know. I, I, I have a feeling it's because it's like most of the, the people who could be get scared or get chased away. Cause you, 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 you said it yourself earlier on when we were, we, we, you were chatting, you said you were there with the pitchforks. Like if Luke and Nets coming after you and getting angry, unless you're extremely self-aware and self-confident and also have the ability to kind of ride that out, you're probably going to run away. And also they're all anonymous. So like, you know, what does that say? Yeah. But I can, I can understand why people would, would not want to be in that environment because it's, it's, it's brutal. No, it's toxic, but you have to also realize like with, with greatness comes great responsibility. Like you want to be the CEO of <laughs> True. You want to be the CEO of something, you know, that just raised at a $4.5 billion valuation. Like that comes with the necessary heat, you know, a friend of mine, cause I was actually, I was getting cold feet, you know, a little bit about this when I first bought Pudgy cause people were kind of attacking me. doesn't know shit. doesn't know what he's doing. He told me, he was like, look, as long as you know what you're doing is right, fuck them. 
And I think that was really important. As long as you know you have integrity and you have a moral high, moral high ground, then like you just got to do what you got to do. Everybody who's achieved great things in life has people on the flip side. You look at Elon Musk. How could anyone shit on Elon Musk? It's like beyond me. But yet he has a cult of five million people that hate him. You know, like, okay, like that's just what comes with part of the game. Like, you know, at some point you've just got to own that and take responsibility. So, yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. And also who, who in this space right now has any right to say, no, no, it's like this, this is the right way to do things. I'm like, no, you don't know that. And actually we should be embracing the people that do things differently and, and try things in a, in a very different way because so many things are forks. Everything's a fork of a fork of a fork of a fork of a fork. Where's the original idea? Where's the where's the human going out out there trying to do something different? I'll tell you what we're trying to do that's different. We know Unreal Engine's a big deal, right? Yeah. And we know that like there are all these PFPs that are 3D characters and everything else. So we invested in Vicon, which is an optical motion capture system. And we're just going to start producing content in Unreal Engine, but like not fully. But, and also not like cinematic, but just use that and be scrappy and be a bit shit and like treat it like a soap opera. And sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't, but tr really force ourselves to explore what that is because literally anybody in the world can, can buy a camera and it looks amazing and they can put some lights up and they can copy what I do. Everything that we do is copyable. Nobody can copy that. Like yeah. it's just too difficult to replicate. So I much rather go and fail repeatedly at something that nobody else can copy. And then over time, iterate and figure it out. And that's the great beauty of like social media and YouTube and everything else. Everyone has a very short memory. They forgive your failures as long as you show up the next day. And that that's, should be the, the only excuse you need to get out there and, and actually do stuff. So okay. yeah, you know what I mean? It's like the, the opportunities are out there if, if you have the eyes to see them. Fun I times. Agree. Yeah. Last question for you. You are, you own apes and um, just curious what your experience of like two weeks ago, the other deeds and the other side were, you've obviously been taking notes and checking out, um, but what, what's your kind of overview of Yuga and where they're at at the moment? Yeah. So I have the utmost respect for those guys, you know, like they've, they've really, spearheaded the way in this space and i think those they're incredible they're a lot smarter than i think people you know give them the benefit of the doubt for i think they're incredibly bright but you know i definitely was upset with how the gas thing shook out and they that wasn't a mistake you know like that's just it I'd like they're too smart they're too calculated in everything that they do they're thinking 10 layers deep. If you really pay attention, they think 10, 20 layers deep. These guys are brilliant. But I think one thing that, you know, broke my heart a little bit was that just that just wasn't on purpose. You know, that I mean, that was on purpose. I mean, like, you know, and and like I love those guys. I think they're phenomenal. I just think like it's about web three winning. It's not about Yuga winning. But maybe that's like what four hundred and fifty million dollars from Andreessen and all of that, you know, maybe that paradigm shifts. But I, that's that was my only reservation. Not to say I'll never sell an ape. They've punished me too many times for selling my apes. I'm holding those things until the day I die. I'm super thankful for that for them. I'm super grateful for all the contributions they made at the space. I think the only time I've been upset with them and where my heart broke a little bit was, you know, you guys are too smart. You know, my developer for Pudgy Penguins, our CTO, you know, you cr has created contracts where you can mint three or four NFTs at a $10 gas fee. If he can do it, you know, you guys can do it too. And they're too smart and they're too methodical in their thought processes. And they go too deep in too many layers for them to make that mistake. That was intentional. And that tells me that they're out to kill, which is fair. Like this is a business. This is about Web3. It's not about Yuga and it's not about Pudgy and it's not about Cool Cats and it's not about any specific project. The space is more to, to the world than one company. And I think that was kind of anti, anti what I think Web3 is about. But hey, it's fair game. And to say that, you know, if there's an opportunity where we raise that type of money, like, and people are in my ear, maybe shifting the paradigm, I, I, you know, we'll probably stand my ground, but who knows, like they're in a position that I'm not in. But I think that was my only reservation is that was 
intentional like that was on purpose you know like you're not you know so yeah it's been fascinating chronicling that one from the inside out right from the get-go seeing this scrappy strange little mint turn into a behemoth the fact yeah. is though that you raise that much money it comes with a certain level of guarantees required yeah. from from the participants and you're right a16z they don't fuck about yeah and, you know their hand is all over this and yeah. you you are also correct that you know when they say dutch auctions are bullshit in a tweet then you all along the dutch auctions are bullshit you don't game that out without figuring you know you don't game out like a massive two hundred thousand piece multi-layered nft collection without seriously considering gas because you won't be able to play that game on ethereum if you want people to actually play it and all the revenue streams for every kind of item and piece of those layers that can then be a royalty in itself i mean like you want massive volume and that doesn't exist on ethereum that just, just won't work so yeah that that has been as you rightly say properly staged for our benefit and um yeah. and yeah that sucks but did we expect anything else it, it if you look at the old history of facebook you know even mark andreessen himself early days of netscape same thing same story it's just been repeated over and over and somebody somewhere breaks it and creates a new paradigm and we're in the, the middle of seeing something like that happen but it's also telling that some of the most successful NFT projects around at the moment, like for instance, Artifact, part with Nike. So you have these th this strange kind of tension between Web 2 and Web 3. And I think you're probably feeling that yourself as well. Like Web 2, I know this and this is it. And Web 3, what does that look like? We don't know. Um, but again, we get to explore and, and try it out in real time with a community that is really in it with you for good, for better or for worse. Yes, sir. I did a lot of talking there. I'm sorry, this is an interview about you, but it's been been really fun to uh, to jam all this stuff. So, give us a glimpse of the future for Pudgies. Is there anything that you kind of excited about that's that's coming up? I, I've seen a map, like a Pudgy map, with all sorts of cute and fun things on it. Is that something we should be paying attention to? Yeah. So that's our quest map, which you know, and you guys are familiar with the term roadmap. The thing is we'll be on many quests. So I think, you know, one thing that's really important to me with Pudgy is the art of storytelling, like without a story, they're just characters on a blockchain. Like what's a stormtrooper without star Wars, what's Harry Potter without Hogwarts. So for me, building the story is super important. If not, they're just images on a blockchain and there really isn't that much fun to that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the business of, you know, blowing people's minds. So I can't tell you too much, uh, but I understand how to make a successful NFT project, at least from the deductions that I've made. And so keeping people on the edge is really important, but I will say this, we have some pretty phenomenal announcements coming up in the next, you know, maybe four to eight weeks that I think will really blow people's minds away. And I think you as now a pudgy holder will be super excited. And I think you'll believe even more in where I'm going to take this and believe even more in the vision once those announcements are made. So I'm looking forward to executing on those. Uh, but, you know, fulfilling the quest map, the quest map's a little vague, but we have a medium article that maybe can add a little bit of clarity to that. Uh, and in the meantime, just my priority is getting over this intolerable sickness that I'm on right now so I can get back to work. Well, I'll let you go. One last question. When you say story, what do you mean? We're writing a book. You're writing a book. So one of the things I, I encounter all the time is people talk about story, but they never mention writers. And like for me, writers, writers are story. Without a writer, there is no story. And they are, they're, they're the most criminally undervalued creative human beings on the planet. So I'm hoping that somewhere we can elevate them, you know? I agree. Yeah, no, we have three authors now on board, one doing a children's book, so something very simple. Uh, and then two of them are working in tandem. Uh, one's an editor, one's an author, uh, but they're working on like a Percy Jackson-esque level type of book, you know, like not too hard, not too easy, you know? Uh, something where like anybody of all ages can go in and have a good time reading it. And it's, you know, we're a couple of chapters in and it's really, really well done. Uh, and I'm somebody who like all I read is fiction. Like I cannot read nonfiction for my life. Uh, so it's something that as a nonfiction, as a fiction reader, I'm like absolutely stoked. And it's kind of a dream come true. So 
Awesome. Well, Luca, this was an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed kind of jamming with you on, on all this stuff because I feel like you, you're on the side of the, the, the penguins, not the angels, but on the side of the penguins and on the side of the, of the right kind of um, line of this. And I was really intrigued when I saw you were the one that, that, that was able to buy pudgies. I didn't know that much about you, but now I see where you're going and I like it. So thanks so much for joining me. And um, hopefully we can talk again soon. I'm, 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 I'm excited. I want to, I want to know, I want to know when alpha. Yes. I got you, Robin. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, man. Take care.